Welcome to the Sack of Stats podcast. It has been a minute. Pam Maldonado is your host, joined by one of my favorite tennis guys in the business, Gil Gross. You can find him on Twitter at Gil underscore Gross. He is the broadcaster for Tennis Channel and host of the Monday Match Analysis on YouTube. I promise you have never watched tennis or if you want to get into tennis, you have to watch his stuff because he does an absolutely fantastic job of breaking down the matches, giving you the strengths and the weaknesses of each player. So Gil, I am so excited to have you today because... We have you, I have you with me to talk ATP majors. Guess what is this week? An ATP major in the French Open, and it is a super exciting one. Uh, Gil, um, yeah, what should we be knowing early on about the French Open for this year? Roland Garros. Always great to be here. Thanks for having me again, Pam. I, I guess everybody is talking about the absence of Rafa Nadal for the first time in 20 years, and he's the defending champion. A lot has changed in a year in, in the world of Nadal. And Novak Djokovic has not had a very encouraging lead-in. Uh, the clay court season has not been very kind to Novak. Hasn't made even a semifinal in the three events he's played. We can talk more specifics. But I, I think the feel of it is that this is an opportunity for somebody else. Last time you and I were with um, whale capper, um, Drew Dinsick, that was back in January talking to the Australian Open. And one of the questions that I asked was, what do you expect from Nadal? I said he's going to retire. Now that's even more solidified that the retirement is next. Would you agree? Like it, it's going to maybe play an event and then retire. What do you think happens in 2024 with Nadal? I mean, he's going to try his best for it not to play out that way. Just like just like Roger didn't want it to end like it ended. Uh, Federer didn't really get to say goodbye on the tennis court, except he had Labor Cup, which was nice that, you know, he had that opportunity and that unique event. But, I mean, I think if Rafa was okay with retiring, he would have retired already, meaning like last week he would have retired, literally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he wants to, even if he's not really going to be his best, I actually, I think he'd like to just soak it all in for a second, play all of his favorite tournaments one last time. And look, I mean, I, I hope he's able to do that. But yeah, sometimes the body can can quit on you to that extent where you can't even do that. Right. Fingers crossed that that he's able to do it. But he he basically gave himself a finish line. He said, 2024 is going to be my last year unless something drastic changes. I know it's so far looking into the future and we don't have crystal balls, but today they asked Carlos Arcaraz how it would, if he would be interested in playing doubles with Nadal in 2024 Olympics. Do you think that could be a possibility that we see? I mean, how fun would that be? That would be great. I would, I would be a little bit concerned about, about Nadal participating in the Olympics. I don't know. It's a great experience, but I would imagine if he's able to play Roland Garros and Wimbledon, that would take priority. And usually with the Olympics, it's kind of nestled uh, in the midst of, of that time of year. Uh, I know in 2021, it was just after Wimbledon. And I mean, that's tough. That's It's a lot. The Olympic years are so physically challenging yeah. for the players. So if I were to actually give my crystal ball is that he doesn't play the Olympics. But how fun that we can just like I know. pretend we can pretend for a second that Akras and Nadal together as a doubles would just be it would blow up the sports world. <laughs> it would absolutely would. Well, let's move over to Roland Garros, which is the 2023 French Open happening now. No Nadal. So that definitely opens up the field to every single person that is on deck. Would you agree that this for 2023 has been pretty volatile for me as far as sports betting? Because I would say that it's been pretty much like Carlos Arcaraz maybe Medvedev right below, and then the rest of the field is pretty even keel. Would you agree that it's just like the rest of the field other than Alcaraz has just like caught up and there's not really any solidified player that stands out, which is, makes it a lot more volatile? Yeah, I mean, not start to finish. Uh, Djokovic owned January. Mm -hmm. Sinner was really great uh, in February, March, and then Monte Carlo. He hasn't been good. Uh, well, he, he hasn't played as much as as he'd like either but but he's kind of fallen off a bit uh runa it was kind of the opposite he's come on he he did not have a great hard court season or first hard court season i should say and ever since he's gotten on the clay he's been good 
has there been a lot of like continuity? No. And, and as far as these clay masters have gone besides, I mean, look, for the most part, they've been very wild. Uh, they have not been chalky at all. Um, especially Madrid was, was insane with, with the quarterfinal lineup. So yeah, it's been, it has been more volatile than, than usual. I would say so. Well, looking at the odds, the current odds right now to win the 2023 French Open, you have Carlos Arcaraz at the plus 160 favorite, followed by Novak Djokovic, who is world number one for very, 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 very long time, plus 260. Then Daniel Medvedev, who jumped up a few spots because he is coming off his win in Rome. Um, Klevedev, followed by Holger Runa, and then Yannick Sinner, Kasper Ruud, Savannah Sitsipin, Sparov, and Rublev um, round out the top 10. Do you think these odds are correct order with Medvedev being the third favorite of the tournament? Yes, I I have him going to the final, and look, I, I I'm careful not to overreact to one event. I, I really am, but uh, logically, um, let me know how de- how much you want me to to get into to all of it. But essentially, where I'm at with Medvedev is I think he is a different player this year because of mainly his forehand, and he it. I, I have a lot of explanations for why he hasn't been good on clay in years past, why he didn't go all the way in Monte Carlo, why he lost third round in Madrid. And I feel like what we saw in Rome is actually the real thing. Mm-hmm. And he beat Runa and he beat Tsitsipas. He's number one in the race. He's won a major before. That is the profile of a guy who should be one of the favorites coming into Roland Garros. And I think he truly is. So I'll piggyback on that. You said you have him in the final. I am, it's a 50-50 for me that he makes it out of the bottom to reach the final. And the only thing that is keeping me from like locking it in into my bracket that yes, he is in the final is the conditions in Rome, wet, rainy, cold. And Mm -hmm. I think that heavily favored his style of play. It forced more of a baseline game. If you look at the weather predictions as of right now for the, at least for the first few days in Paris, warm, hot, sunny. It's not the same. So he's not, he shouldn't have the same ben- benefit um, of weather conditions. Do you think that has, am I looking too deep into that? No, it's, it's a very interesting point that, uh, that I've seen, I've seen made. Um, I mean, look, jo- uh, Medvedev's ball is very flat. Mm-hmm. One of the assets of his baseline game is how he keeps the ball low and it's hard to attack the ball when it stays low. But the drier the clay is, the higher the ball bounces. It kind of mitigates partially uh, what he does. That said, the clay being a little bit quicker and and livelier, I mean, in some ways, it it might actually help his his kind of uh baseline aggression and his offense which is what i think he's improved so much that's what i think is the big difference a lot of people are pointing to his movement which i think is definitely part of it but the reason why i never thought medvedev would reach these heights on clay Mm -hmm. i did always think he'd do better than he had been doing but it was because he was not a heavy ball striker his ball didn't didn't you know he couldn't generate offense from behind the baseline in slower conditions but ever since changing his string before the season his Mm -hmm. forehand just has much more zip on it and suddenly that's not a problem for him anymore and i think that's made all the difference but the conditions thing is an interesting angle i also feel like though there's he's got a good draw center is a great matchup for him Uh, The way Yannick is just kind of that linear power player. Medvedev always kind of eats up those kinds of players. And then, you know, I think Runa in the semifinals, he wore Runa down physically in best of three. So what is that going to look like in best of five? Right. And you're, you're, you're speaking my language. I agree with all of that. I haven't passed center. I haven't passed Holger. It was just these conditions well, and we don't know what's going to happen, what the conditions are going to be like in two weeks. The rain, might, it's usually rain, windy, oh, rainy and windy and cold, in, especially the nighttime in Roland Gar- at Roland Garros. Right now, it's kind of like too good to be true that the weather looks awesome. <laughs> so in two yeah. weeks, that might change, of which I might be more inclined to back them then. Um, but I'm in full agreement with you. Um, his style of play, I would, 
that's interesting. I didn't think of it about, yes, his ball is flat, but he's, I didn't know that he changed his string. That's good to know. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. So then looking at, we'll, we'll start right out of the back of looking at each quarter, starting first with the fourth quarter then where Medvedev is um, the main character in this. He has players like uh, Nishioka, uh, Born and George, who has been having a pretty good season. And uh, Yannick could be facing Yannick Sinner in the semifinal. And you said easy draw. Yeah. Where does it, in what level do you expect Medvedev to have his first test? Honestly, I, I love Medvedev's draw in general. Uh, I do think he got some bad news today with, uh, with his first round opponent, which is Tiago Seboth. Uh, it's really veiled, but I think a lot of people will call him wild still. Wild. I'm not, <laughs> yeah, Tiago Seboth wild. I mean, again, he has been out of the limelight. So when he first came up, that's what the broadcasters were calling him, but that's not, I don't think that's the actual way to call. Uh, that's, I don't think that's his real name. Anyway, he, his career got totally disrupted by COVID mm -hmm. and I don't know what happened, but something happened and he wasn't, you know, he totally fell off the map. He's been back recently. He's got this massively powerful forehand. Like it is a brutalizing forehand. And now, you know, Medvedev, he's come through qualifying. Medvedev has to face him first round. Uh, that, to me, is uh, is actually the most, the thing that scares me probably most in Sinner's draw because uh, the rest is is really good. Medvedev against Thiago, see both. Maybe Wild, maybe something else. He is a minus 2,000 favorite against him. Are you calling for, like, a possible upset? Or just it's, it's, it's too difficult of a match that's going to test him early on? What are you thinking about that match in general? Here's what I'll say. Among all of the qualifiers, it's one of the, it, it might be the qualifier that you least want to play. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not calling upset. It's just when I first looked at his draw and I say, oh, he gets a qualifier first round. Well, that that's generally a good thing, but he, I think he got a bad I think I, he did get bad luck with the qualifier that he ended up drawing. I think a particularly dangerous qualifier. Uh, just getting into kind of what else there is. Nishioka is his seed in the third round. I think he'll lose to JJ Wolf, to be honest. So that's a great seed to have. Uh, then you have Chorich, uh, Tiafo, Zverev. Zverev, who he's beaten three times this year. Mm -hmm. uh, Dimitrov is there. I just think, I just think it's a great quarter for Medvedev. So then you're saying that the best bet should be backing Medvedev to win his quarter. Plus 175. Plus 175. I believe. Yeah. Yes, I would I would like that. I'm gonna go ahead and put that down. Medvedev to win his quarter. I don't dislike that because I also have him in the semifinals. To win his quarter. Plus 175. Easy. Done. Looking at the third quarter, then you have players like Holger Runa, who I am super excited to see. I know the argument with Holger Runa right now, first off, I'm in love with his game. I'm not in love with his personality. I wish he was better. I wish he was a little bit more mature. There's just such a drastic difference in maturity level between Holger Runa, who is 20 years old, and Carlos Alcaraz, who is 20 years old. They are the same age with a lot of similar experiences, and there's just a, dr a drastic level in competitive um, respect. <laughs> I'll go ahead, and, go ahead and say, but I mean, Runa, since he defeated Novak Djokovic at ATP Paris back in November, he's kind of been on a tear himself, and I think his uh, abilities and his game is kind of a little bit uh muted just because he you have Carlos Alcaraz who's sh shadowing the accomplishments that Runa is going through but he's reached the final at ATP Masters Monte Carlo he just won a clay event ATP 250 Munich um I would want I have been saying and I'm just gonna like hold to it that his style of game his style of play it is mimicking that of Novak is he as flexible no but it has a lot of, it has a lot of similarities what do you think about Holger's quarter and we both have him to reach the semis. Um, but is there anything in there that is interesting to you? His draw, his the players' his opponents, his style of play, mimicking that of Djokovic. Um, what do you think about Runez in general? I mean, he's just so talented defensively. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, earlier in the year, he was very impatient and a little bit overzealous offensively. And he wasn't allowing himself to really utilize his defensive capabilities because he was making so many errors as soon as he got on the clay 
it just clicked for him and he started playing with more margin. And, you know, ever since then, I, I think he's had the best clay court season out of anybody making the Monte Carlo final, the Rome final, winning the title in Munich. The best part about Runa is he's so unafraid of the moment, though. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's seven and two to start his career against top five players. There hasn't been that learning curve of how do I handle big matches? That just hasn't been there. So Runa, for the first time in his career, comes into a major with expectations to contend for the title. Right. Usually, that's really tough. It was tough on Alcaraz last year in the same position where you know, I don't think he was playing his best in Paris. He almost lost to Ramos Vinolas because he was really feeling the pressure. I don't worry about the pressure with Runa, and I really don't worry about him through you know the first four rounds of this event. The stamina is the question mark. He's kind of built like a fullback. You know, he he. There's a lot of weight that he's moving around the court, and I just don't know that his stamina and maybe it suffers because of that. I don't think it's really caught up to his explosiveness athletically. So my concern with Runa is that he might wear down, but that's where the concern ends. I love his game. I love his mental. As far as, you know, his draw goes, I, I also think that it's, uh, I think it's pretty advantageous because I, I actually really like uh, Struff to make the quarterfinal. Um, I which have Struff uh, in the quarterfinal too. Oh, really? Wow. I have him upsetting Casper. Yeah, me as well. I, I think Casper has a gauntlet. First of all, he's struggling with confidence, but Casper has a gauntlet of highly aggressive, big weapon players who are going to play very fearless. And that's the kind of opponent that Ruta has struggled with all year long. So I think if, if he makes it through, you know, the rest of the guys I'm thinking of, uh, example, even Sasha Bublik in the second round, who almost beat him in Rome. If he gets it through, you know, all the way through there, I do think Struff takes him out. Talk about somebody who's not going to wear down Runa physically. It's never physical with Struff. Those are quick points. I mean, I think things are looking good for, for Runa. My concerns come starting in the semifinal for him. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting that you bring up uh, Jan Leonard Struff because he was my potential to possibly win the quarter. Holger Runa right now is plus 125 to win th the quarter three ahead of Casper Ruud, Francisco Sarandolo, Taylor Fritz. Um, but I think Struff, if you both you and I are contemplating that he has an opportunity here to potentially upset Ruud if he himself does make it to that spot, then I also believe that he has a huge, uh, not a huge probability, but he has he has the ability <laughs> to upset Holger Runa as well. And especially if we're talking about stamina, you Struff hits everything back. <laughs> he is a bit of a backboard and he has plays with high high aggression as well. He's 25 to one to win quarter three. Is that of any interest? Yeah, I think you take it. Again, the X factor with Runa, other than the stamina, is, look, he hasn't shown any signs of the pressure getting to him at any point. But at some point in his career, it's going to happen. It's not, it's not like the guy's never going to get nervous. It will happen. You know, is it going to be this, this major where there's expectations on him? Again, first time he's ever entered a major with expectations that he's going to contend for the title going through the first couple rounds, like, Hey, you know, you're supposed to win this thing. You know that, right? <laughs> um, so who knows what's going to happen? You never know. Also just mentally and emotionally, he's pretty volatile. Uh, so look, I, I couldn't see Struff. I think stylistically, if it's Struff Runa, uh, it's probably maybe, maybe a hedging spot, the quarterfinals, if they play 25 to one on a guy who you're confident will make it to the last date that, that seems like a, a value play. Moving to the second quarter of the draw, Novak Djokovic. He is coming into this not looking like the typical Novak Djokovic that we see. Um, he's lost a few matches. He looks a little bit winded. He has an injury to his hamstring, an injury to his elbow. He was seen wearing sleeves. Um, he has kines tape, all parts of his body. And more important to me, what I saw in his last match against Holger Runa in his loss um, in Rome was that he took painkillers mid-match I cannot remember the last time I saw Novak Djokovic take anything to help to assist with his body um, especially mid-match not just straight off the court maybe he's doing that goes into the locker room and hides but this was like no give it to me now I'm doing it let's go <laughs> that was a bit of a shocker to me which tells me he's really going through something 
um, physically. What do you think about Novak Djokovic as the second favorite to win Roland Garros? I agree. And I mean, backstory here but with Novak, he, he does not like uh, Western medicine. I, he, exactly. he does not want to take painkillers. Uh, it's not something that he will be doing unless he absolutely needs to. Uh, I also think there are some issues. Um, also his mood, I would add, like he's yeah. been in not a good mood on the court. And I just think it's because of the elbow. I think he's upset about, about the state of his, uh, of his body. Uh, that said, obviously we know that if, if he is healthy, if he does work through it, if he does find his form, well, now he's a guy who has far more majors to his name than anybody else in the draw, or I should say everybody else in the draw combined. Combined. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, he won the first major of the year. So we're not being prisoners of the distant past by just giving Djokovic the benefit of the doubt. Look, I, I, I think, I think he's in a vulnerable spot. Um, I, I feel like if he matches up against Fuchovic in the second round or Davidovic Fakina in the third round, those are matches where I would, I would have some anxiety about them. I would potentially sprinkle on the, those heavy, heavy underdogs in that spot, just in case. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I feel like, I feel like you might hit, um, now, after that, after the first three rounds, things soften up. Obviously, he would have wins under his belt at that point. Then he has uh, a pretty favorable uh, draw. I think the fourth round opponents are, let me uh, refresh myself on, on who those guys are. Um, Herkoch and Bautista Agut are the two seeds potentially in his fourth round. No worries at all. None. I mean, I have Greek Spore coming out of that, uh, Talon Greek Spore, but he's been really struggling a lot recently. So who knows who comes out of there? And then quarterfinals, well, you know, Rublev, he's had a really favorable really head-to-head against. Yeah. I mean, Rublev has had a good season, yeah. but yeah. But when they played at the Australian Open, he made Andre Rublev look like the world number 75. Mm-hmm. Hatchinov, maybe. He's beaten Hatchinov seven times in a row. If Novak is at his best... Those are not threatening quarterfinal opponents compared to what he could have had. Tsitsipas, Runa. Right. I mean, those were possibilities. But it's actually he, to his benefit that he's the number three seed, <laughs> that he's coming into this as world number three um, because he's potentially getting a f- more favorable draw out of it. Well, Djokovic, yeah. he has two Roland Garros titles. His last one was in 2021. He has an 85 and 16 record here. Eight of those 16 losses, though, was to Nadal. <laughs> So you cannot at all blame him for having as many losses. But of course, that hamstring injury, that elbow injury, he's 20 and four this year, but he's three and two against top 10 opponents. What I have seen is that in addition to the injuries and yes, you see his uh, demeanor on court, he's a lot more upset about everybody, (laughs) about everything Uh, more than usual. He's typically known as the villain, but he's even more villainous this time around. His stamina His stamina in a best of three has been highly suspect, and that's just not something that you see of a typical Djokovic. Is it because he's out of rhythm? Is it because um, his in and out, his tournaments, he hasn't really had a fluid season where he's going from tournament to tournament to tournament. He's had a lot of stop and go activity. Do you think that's affecting his stamina? Are you worried about his stamina? A little bit. I think think a lot of it is the stop and start. I also think part of it is just he's post-physical prime Djokovic. Right. Uh, and the stamina hasn't been the same, I don't think, for a while. So then the key becomes, how does he overcome that? And on on other surfaces, there's a lot of ways that he does. On clay, he needs to be hitting his forehand at the highest level possible. He needs to be hitting it big and heavy. If you watch like when he last won RG in 2021, that was the difference maker. His forehand was on fire. He was crushing it. It was big and heavy. The the cross court angles against Nadal were just unbelievable. Mm-hmm. That's what he needs to get to, and his forehand hasn't looked even close to good enough thus far. Djokovic is a minus one seventy five to win the second quarter. Behind him is a huge, it's a huge differential. You have Andre Rublev at five and a half to one, Hatchinoff at eleven to one, Fokina. 1401, Hubert Hercatch, 1801, RBA. And then it just like gets further and down because there's not anybody there. If you look at his quarter, though, it is a very friendly quarter. Um, 
do you think minus 175 is warranted for the condition that we're seeing him? Is there any other player that you would consider an under an, consider a long shot to win Q2? Yeah, I'd go Hatchinov at at 11 to 1. If uh if someone is going to take advantage of of Djokovic's vulnerabilities, uh well you have confidence in Rublev who is the Monte Carlo champion, but Wow, is he that much better than Hatchinov? Hatchinov, who just beat him in in Madrid. Madrid. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's uh, Hatchinov, who has I think a four three favorable head to head against him. Hatchinov, who's made two straight major semifinals. No, the difference the difference is is not that big uh, between Rublev and Hatchinov. So I would go, I would go with Hatchinov's price there uh, over over Rublev's. It's much better, um, and you know I. If, if Rublev and Hatchinov play, the way I see that match playing out, honestly, that goes deep into a fifth set. It's tough. It's physical. It's nervy. And I actually think the, the physicality of Hatchinov and some of the, the confidence that he's been bringing in majors actually gets him over the edge there. And we've also seen under Rublev, he kind of clams up in these big time situations, um, gets to a fifth set, and maybe he, his confidence kind of goes out the window. What you saw from the first four sets of him, he doesn't show in the fifth. You can't close out these big time matches in big pressure point situations. Well, there's this big weight on his shoulders, I think, because he's he's 0 for 6 in major quarterfinals. And, you know, until he gets, until he wins one of those, I think he's really going to feel that. That's okay. unfortunately, you know, that that's what happens. We saw Felix, that happened with finals. It's like the more you lose that match, the worse it gets when it comes to just how in your head you are. Cool and rainy versus warm and sunny. Which would you want for a hatch enough to win over Rublev? Hmm. And then same question in relation to Djokovic. Yeah. I, I actually think you'd want it cool and, and rainy. Uh, The, I think as, as physical, you'd want that match. Hatchinov would want that match as physical as possible. Yeah. And if if he would want his his defense, uh, or at least you know his ability to rem- remain unattackable, uh, be at its height. So I think the more lively it is, the more Rublev's forehand can have a, can leave a big imprint on the match. Mm-hmm. I would say, uh, for Djokovic. I, I have seen some people say that the Rome conditions were bad for Novak, and that's part of the reason that he wasn't able to do well there. I don't really agree with that because Djokovic uh, is the best lower bounce tennis player in the world, has been for a long time. He doesn't want the ball. Yeah, he doesn't want the ball jumping above his shoulders. Uh, he's actually, especially the backhand, much worse when it gets up high. So. I, I actually like Djokovic when the ball isn't bouncing as high. Interesting. So then for the quarter two to win, a long shot is Karen Hetchinoff, 11-1. Most likely, would you still put Djokovic as most likely? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I do have him advancing, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet that number. Looking at the first quarter then, where we have the most interesting player in the world right now, Carlos Arcaraz, also a minus 175 favorite to win his quarter at be ahead by also large margin to Stefano Sissipas, 4-1, to Lorenzo Musetti, who's interesting, 12-1, to one. Cam Nori, 16-1, Felix Ogier Lassim, Denis, Shapop, Denis Shapovalov, Sebastian Corda, and then the list goes on. Um, Carlos Arcaraz. Why can't we say about him that hasn't already been said? He has absolutely every weapon at his disposal. He has the stamina. He has, more importantly, we're talking about like the stamina and we're talking about the baseline game and the power and everything else. But what I have been most impressed with, um, and is also a difference between whole him and Runa right now, is just the, the court sense that he has. He knows exactly when to implement what type of shot and when to lay back on certain shots. And you see that adjustment being made mid-match as well. He's maybe hyper aggressive in the first set. It didn't work out. He chills out in the second set because he's like, I need to pull back a little bit or I need to come in with a little bit more aggression. He is making those mid match um, changes that you only see from the big three. And he just does it so well and effortlessly. I'm just so impressed with this game every single time I watch him. Every single time I watch him, I feel like I learned something new about him. Yeah. And that's a big, big difference between last year. 19-year-old Carlos Alcaraz and uh, 
this, uh, you know, the, the elder statesman of the Carlos Alcaraz who just turned 20 years old. He's really learned how to play more solid at times, which is, it's not, again, it's not really the plan A for him. Like he wants to hit winners. Uh, yeah. There's no doubt about what he likes to do, uh, which is attack and hit winners. But he does recognize when the situation calls for a little bit more consistency. I think that's made a, a world of difference. Um, I don't think there were a couple performances last year where I felt Alcaraz was pretty bad. Uh, and this year, even though we lost to Fabian Morojan, who not at hasn't all worried. Yeah. And, but, but I also don't think that was an atrocious performance. Right. I don't think he played that bad. I thought Marojan uh, miraculously played the match of his life. Um, obviously, but not only did he play the match of his life, I thought the match of his life was actually an unbelievably high level match. Mm -hmm. So not worried about that. You're allowed to have a bad day in the office. You're allowed to take a loss. It's the first of the year for Alcaraz. But what and... you're referencing for those who maybe are less familiar is that Carlos Alcaraz is 20 and two on clay this year. And he had one yeah. loss just last a uh, couple of weeks ago in the second round of the Italian open to a qualifier in straight sets. Shocked the world. Everybody said, oh, that's it. He's not winning Roland Garros. Look at him. He just lost to a quali. Well, you also have to consider that one, he has been playing a lot of tennis. Um, he's won three of his last four tournaments. He won Indian Wells. He made the semifinals of Miami Open. And then back-to-back, -back, he won Barcelona and Madrid. And then right in front of Roland Garros to happen. So I was not at all surprised that he did lose. As you mentioned, it was one hell of a match from his opponent. Um, spectacular play. But it was also a perfect timing situation for him to come into this and pull out an out-of-the-nowhere upset but I'm not at all worried simply because of the amount of tennis that Carlos has been playing. Probably huge benefit for him to have lost. <laughs> yeah, potentially. I, I, you know, he gets two weeks rest. Uh, I think one week rest would have probably been enough. So like, had he won Rome, I don't think it would have been bad for his prospects, but it, it would have been bad for betters, right? I mean, it would have been bad if you want to back him because what do you think? Would he be if he had won Rome? Would he be minus money to no, win it all? Zero chance. No, I think it's so. Right. What would he be? Plus one twenty? Probably closer to like the one thirty range. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think it would have been a significant difference. It probably still would have stayed between the one forty to one fifty five range. Okay. I mean that's good. That's smart. That means that means you know the market isn't reacting too much to one tournament, and they exactly. shouldn't. Exactly. Well, I mean, Akras, like I said, he's 20 and two on clay. He's four and zero against top 10 opponents just this year alone. He has 10 titles overall, seven of which have been won on clay. And the audacity that some people have to tell me on Twitter, clay isn't even his best surface. Um, excuse me. Are you watching? <laughs> are you not watching? Would you say that clay is Carlos Akras' best surface? Yeah. I mean, but mainly it's just anything slow is anything gonna slow. be his yeah. best surface. Uh, just because just because he can get rushed sometimes, but when he has time on the ball, it's, it's just so, so tough to deal with, with his array of offense. And um, yeah, I think your only hope against Alcaraz is really to rush him. You cannot give him time. You have to take time away uh, by taking the ball early and hitting the ball really, really hard. Djokovic does that. Well, center does that. Well, yeah. Um, but the court surface is going to also play into that. And we saw, I mean, just think about Alcaraz at Indian Wells. That was pure dominance. I mean, Medvedev in that, Medvedev in that final was absolutely lost. He could not find anything successful in that final. And I don't think that happens on a quick surface. Right. Looking at his at Alcaraz, however, this is his third Rolling Garros experience, his second without having to qualify. Do you think the lack of experience at Roland Garros matters? Question one. And two, comparing 2022 Roland Garros to now, he lost to Alexander Zverev in four in the quarterfinal. What are the two differences about those two facts coming into this tournament? The biggest difference... Well, okay, let's, let's rewind to last year. It was a moment in time where Alcaraz had just solidified his hype. Uh... You know, people into the sport who watch the sport, they were singing Alcaraz's praises uh, 
far before he won the Madrid Open, right? Right. But that could easily be met with, what are you talking about? He hasn't, he hasn't done anything. Like, what has he accomplished? Uh, after he won, you know, Miami, it was, okay, like, whoop de doo he's won one, of, he, he's won one big tournament. Like, everybody calm yourselves. Right. After he won Madrid, and he beat Nadal, and he beat Djokovic, and he crushed Zverev in the final. That was kind of the moment where it's like, yeah, uh, us tennis analysts who are saying that he's really, really good. Yeah, we're right. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Alcaraz, when he went into the French, he was feeling a, a new level of pressure, and he was not handling it well. And I would say from that point up until the U.S. Open, he was really struggling with handling the pressure. He was playing a lot of the, you know, the worst tennis he had played all season. It just didn't look like what it looked like in March and April when, when he was at a much higher level. Now, uh, since that time, he's won a major. Yes. And that is the best thing going for him. Because when you haven't won your major, you, just like we were talking about with Rublev and mm -hmm. not making a semifinal, you feel that zero, that zero is a weight on your shoulders. And once that zero becomes a one and you've won a major already, you've shown you can do it, there's so much less pressure on you. And that's the biggest difference is that although Alcaraz is the favorite, the pressure is not insane. And he's also proven that that pressure kind of doesn't get to him right now because he won Barcelona and Madrid this year. He defended his titles and coming into those tournaments, you have that pressure of, is he going to defend his title or is 2022 season the fluke? He came right yeah. out and just like <laughs> destroyed everybody how he needed to again with ease. Um, didn't really have a lot of like tough matches. He kind of just like kind of cruised through some of those defending titles. Do you think that helps? For sure. Uh, he, this year should what's happened so far this year should instill him with a lot of confidence and you know the point you're making about the smaller events yes they're not majors but still you have to get used to coming into a, an event as a top seed and someone who's expected to win it you have a target on your back uh you, you feel the pressure from the fans you feel it from the media uh and you feel it from yourself because you do want to replicate uh the success that you've had previously and Alcaraz, you're right, is now used to that. He is a veteran at that. Uh, that is a big deal because that that was really, you know, the question mark last year. And and the question mark in general, I think even coming into this year, technically, you know, is he going to get a little bit more consistent? Uh, is he going to be able to sometimes reel back his shot selection at times? Uh, is he going to improve the serve? But then the third thing was, how is he going to deal with the pressure? Mm hmm so far, I feel like all three of those things he has shown awesome progress in. Would you say then betting Arcaraz minus 175 to win his quarter is value? I think with certain players, let me preface this, with certain players like Djokovic when he was on an absolute tear back in 2016-17, just won everything, 15, um, Nadal coming into Roland Garros every year. Uh, would or you know even jo Djokovic at Wimbledon? There's there's certain players at certain tournaments where it makes sense that anything below two to minus two hundred is kind of some value. Do you think minus one seventy five Akras to win the first quarter ahead of Stefano Tsitsipas and all the other players value? Yeah, uh, I would just take him to win uh, probably, but the question I guess is like. In the TT Pass matchup, um, he's four and zero in that match. In that matchup, it's going the wrong way for for Stefanos. Like every time they play, he seems to get further away from being able to win. <laughs> uh, I do think that that TT Pass will hit the backhand a little bit better than he did in Barcelona when they played uh, earlier earlier this year. But yeah, I mean, I feel pretty comfortable, pretty safe with Alcaraz. The the Marojan loss just doesn't doesn't really scare me like it probably scares some. Another option is for Akras to reach the final. Um, would you peg that for? I mean, I have Akras to win. Spoiler alert: I have Akras yeah. to win. Um, 
I'm not worried about his quarter. I'm not worried about the top half of the draw with Djokovic because I know Djokovic and I just, I don't feel like he, I don't have any confidence in him where his 70% game is competitive in this. Um, Maybe 70, 80% Novak at Wimbledon, still better than the field. Not here on a clay court service in a best of five where you need your stamina, you need your physicality in order to sustain some of those long rallies. So because of that, I have Carlos Alcaraz to win. Um, who's your prediction to win Roland Garros? Also, Carlos Alcaraz. I couldn't agree more with with what you just said. Um, I've been I've been saying that as well. I mean, we've seen we've seen Djokovic win the Australian Open injured twice in in recent times. Wimbledon 2021 was another major that I thought he was not playing that well. Uh, he was pretty tight because of the uh, history on the line going for the Grand Slam. Still won it. Still won it fairly easily. But this is likely to be a different story. And I have questions about Runa physically if he can get there. Uh, Sinner, the nerves. Medvedev, I think about the Indian Wells final and how when Alcaraz got patient and consistent in slow conditions against Medvedev, Daniil just had no answers to that. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of just checking all the boxes and Alcaraz is my choice. I didn't come all that close to picking anybody else. No. So I think I'm probably even like a ladder. <laughs> it's terrible. But Akaras to reach the final, Akaras plus whatever number you can get to win. I took Akaras back in February <laughs> to win this tournament. Um, the best number that I could get was 185. I know that people, when I tweeted it, people were saying 225. I live in Texas, guys. I am limited by what I have offered here. <laughs> so that is <laughs> that was my option, and I grabbed it because I it was right before clay season, and I was like, he's going to win a couple titles. <laughs> And then that number is going to change. Sure enough, it did. Um, so, yes. How do you see this playing out then? Your best prediction, 2023 Roland Garros, who is the exact final? Uh, it is Alcaraz defeats Medvedev. What a world we're living in when Ma- Klaivedev makes the Roland Garros final. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm a believer in Klaivedev. I know how it's going to look. I know what it's going to look like. If, if he if he loses, it's going to look like a total overreaction to Rome. But, you know, got to gotta not think about that and just stick with what I believe. And, and I, I think it's uh, I think Klaivedev's for real. You think Klaivedev is for real? Looking at the first round matches, have you looked at the first round matches? Are there any that catch your eye? Yeah, only a little bit. Uh, I I think I think Shapovalov goes down to Nakashima. Now Nakashima is actually a slight favorite in favorite. that match, but yeah. I just I just can't see Shapovalov uh, coming through it with with the wins that Nakashima uh, got this week, and. I have I don't have any faith in Dennis to play his level. I, I imagine with the injuries that he's had and the mm-hmm. just the discomfort that he generally feels moving on clay and his and his inconsistency uh, when it comes to just trying to limit the errors. I I think he's probably playing this because it's a major. You collect a great check. It's what you do as a tennis player. You want to play the slams, but man, I I, I don't have confidence that he's gonna really be able to be competitive uh, when it comes to his level in that match. The two upsets that I have in the first round, I have not bet yet. I still need to dig a little further, but at a first glance, the two upsets that I like is Mackenzie McDonald over Sebastian Corda and Fabio Fonini over Felix Azir Aliasim. And it's pretty simple. FAA and Corda just don't have any reps under their belt in clay court season, um, both from injury, both from Sebastian Corda has played only three tournaments totals in this year in 2023 two matches three three matches lost both faa has played two clay matches lost both they're just out of form on surfaces that don't really suit their game faa is especially probably more interested in grass season coming up against fabio fanini who is a more of a clay court specialist and at least mackenzie mcdonald is a backboard who hits everything back so those would be my upsets right out of the gate yeah those are those are definitely guys with with a lot of question marks. I, I do think Felix at some point in that match would just figure it out. Uh, I would almost take the angle, like maybe take Fanini to win the first set. Right. So I can't see Fanini winning three sets against Felix, especially because FA has been pretty good at Roland Garros. He hasn't been good on clay, right. but something about that clay he tends to like. And I, I just think once he kind of gets in rhythm in that match, he'll start to roll Fanini physically. 
has been looking a little bit rough recently. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's angles there. For for Mackey, yeah. I mean, you just don't know if Corda is going to kind of be very wasteful, kind of litter on four stairs. That's a possibility in that match. And if he does, McDonald will make enough balls to take advantage of that. One last question. I have to get my Dominic team information in. <laughs> I am still just waiting for the day where he breaks through and looks like his old self. And you see glimpses of team looking like his old self when it's a beautiful down the line backhand. Maybe the, it's just what is going on with team? What does he need to get back to old version um, of winning, not just matches again, but winning tournaments? How deep do you expect him to run in Roland Garros? Well, it looked really good in Madrid. He pushed Tsitsipas to a third set tie break. Correct. But then he goes to play two challengers. And <laughs> yeah, you want to see him win those events. Yeah. Like it's not good enough to make the semifinal and lose in the semis if if, if, if you're really trying to be a, I don't know, a top 30 version of Dominic team at the very least. And I don't know even if, that, if that's being too ambitious and setting the bar too high. Uh, but I'm... I'm wondering if he's still like able to really motivate himself when he's playing these challengers. And if he's not, is it worth it? Because he he really did look like he was in a better place. And I, I was surprised to see him kind of uh, lose it a little bit. I will say this perspective, a little perspective here. He's in a much better place than he was one year ago when he came into to RG having lost, I think six matches in a row and then he lost to like Hugo Delian pretty easily. <laughs> so look, one year later, he is doing better. But I think what he really needs is a big win. Like, I don't think being close what is good enough. What constitutes a big win for him right now? Because, I mean, like you said, he played two challengers. And then when he lost, he lost in straight sets. So what's a big, I don't know. what con- I think winning the first round of Roland Garros is probably a big win. <laughs> No, but he needs more than that. Like, I think he needs to beat a top 20 player for him to be like, oh, wait, I can do this. I was hoping that moment was going to be against Tsitsipas, the, oh, wait, I can do this moment. But no, like maybe he needs to have his arms raised at the end for that to actually uh, be a thing. Oh, man, I am just, it breaks my heart every single time watching him lose these matches because you want so badly for him to just like, find it, find it. And it just, it doesn't come to fruition. So if I'm frustrated as a fan, you've got to imagine the frustration from him having gone, having to go through this for what now, two years. It's, it's very difficult to climb back into the top 100, top 50. I don't know. Look, I, I hope I, or I don't know if I hope, but you know, there is a possibility team was talking about issues with his motivation after winning the U S open. I mean, maybe that's still an issue. Um, I mean, maybe he's not training as hard as he was when he was 25 years old and he was, you know, eight in the world trying to reach the top, trying to reach the pinnacle. And he got there. He is 29 years old. Yeah. But like, I don't think, Look, he's not out of his athletic prime, right? Especially right. especially nowadays. But I'm not positive that he has gotten back to being the animal that he was before he won the U.S. Open. Uh, and just like reading his quotes and the things he's been saying, because that's all I have to work with. Like, I'm not watching him train. I'm not in the gym with him. Right. But he doesn't seem he doesn't seem as pissed off as maybe he should. Yeah. So you think a lack of interest still. Lack maybe. Of motivation. Maybe. 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 I mean, I'm not saying that's what it is, but I'm saying it's a possibility. <sighs> well, we'll see what happens with this year's 2023 French Open Rolling Garros. I'm super excited. I, as much as I absolutely loved it all and I am not ready to see him retire, I am extremely sad that we're not seeing him this clay season, much less in this tournament. And the same token, I am very excited about we're going to have a new champion not named at all. And it could be Akaras, which is obviously what we're both hoping for, expecting to happen. 
but it could also be Novak Djokovic. It could be Holger Rune. It could be Klaivedev, like just the unknown. It's not a hundred percent guarantee that Akaras is going to win this. So that no. also opens out possibility to a slew of other players. And I am excited for this year's French open for that reason. We see something different. We're going to see something different. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I can get to, you know, five or six names that I wouldn't be that surprised if if they win it all. So then some of, to recap some of the predictions that we made, Medvedev to win his quarter plus 175. Struff to win quarter three um, is a long shot of a choice, but Runa more, more than likely will be the option plus 125 to win the third quarter. Hatchinov to win quarter two. And then, of course, we both have Carlos Agaras to win his second major after winning the U.S. Open last year to win the 2023 French Open at plus 165. Whatever number you can get, honestly, um, is what we were both expecting. Would you expect, would you be surprised? Okay, this is like a super long shot question just for fun. Akaras wins this tournament. How many sets is he dropping? Uh, three. That's a pretty smooth sale <laughs> to a <tie laughs> major. <laughs> well, I don't know. I have, I have four in the semis, four in the final, meaning like four setters. Four sets. And I mean, I don't know, before then, I think one is is fair. That's the thing is if he's if he's approaching, you know, a big three level of tennis and statistics would say he is this year, mm -hmm. then he shouldn't be dropping that many sets in the first four rounds because Nadal wasn't. We'll put it that way. And Nadal won every title that he did without dropping a set. So I'm so curious that if Arcaraz makes it to the final, what's it going to look like? I'm so excited for the French Open. Roland Garros, here we go. Go Garros, thank you so much for hanging out with me, talking as tennis the second major of the year. You can find his find him on Twitter at Gil underscore Gross. You can find his stuff. He is a broadcaster for Tennis Channel, so do make sure to check out his commentary. He's fantastic. Plus his YouTube channel, Monday Match Analysis. Gil, thanks for hanging out, man. Thanks, Pam. Always great. Thank that does it for another episode of Stack of Stuff.